here's where we begin. We begin on the breaking news this morning. Kim Jong-un appearing to be on his way to Russia right now to meet Vladimir Putin. A South Korean government official tells CNN it looks like the North Korean dictator is headed there on a train that departed from Pyong Pyongyang. Now, moments ago, the Kremlin and North Korean state media confirmed the meeting would happen soon, but did not specify exactly when. You'll remember, last week, U.S. intelligence warned Kim was planning to meet with Putin to discuss supplying weapons for the war in Ukraine in exchange for satellite and nuclear submarine technology. Joining us now, Sumi Terry, former North Korean analyst for the CIA. Um, thanks so much for being here and for your time. This is an incredibly consequential meeting. U.S. officials uh, had been warning about this meeting. Now that we know it's in the midst of happening, what should people be looking for to come out of it? Well, so first of all, um, I think the Biden administration leaked intelligence about their meeting so to prevent from this from happening. But obviously, we can do that because we don't have a lot of leverage with North Korea because talks with no, Pyongyang has completely broken down. What's very concerning is the transfer of technology. Um, not only that North Korea is now going to be a supplier of ammunition and artillery shells to Russia's efforts, uh, war efforts, it's Russia's technology for North Korea's nuclear missile program. So that's very concerning. Um, you know, it's ironic and pathetic in a way that North Korea is now resorting to asking aid from, you know, asking North Korea's help. Uh, on this, but I think it's, you know, North Korea has a runway nuclear program. They need sensitive technology for nuclear power submarines, for their satellites, and so on. So this exchange, this cooperation is very concerning. I think it's also fascinating, and I wonder about sort of the broader impact of this pariah state being needed. It's now needed by Russia in its war in Ukraine, and how that changes Kim Jong un's mindset emboldens him as he gains this new weapons technology from Russia? Does it make North Korea more dangerous? I, it's absolutely right. This is what I'm saying about Putin. It's, it, no, Russia is supposed to be a patron of North Korea, not, not asking 198th rank, ranked economy in the world that cannot feed its own population for help. Yeah. But North Korea loves to play China of Russia. Um, so what's interesting is what China's response is going to be all about this, because because it's going to make North Korea less dependent on China if you can also rely on Russia for aid and technology and so on. So we'll see what China's reaction is. But yes, Kim Jong-un is, you know, it's, he or, already the ex external environment was favorable for North Korea in terms of their nuclear missile program, expanding it. United Nations Security Council could not do absolutely anything about this because Russia and China refused to help. It refused to implement sanctions and refused to pressure North Korea. So yes, absolutely, Kim Jong-un is emboldened, and there's absolutely no repercussions for his yeah. actions. Can we step back? And to Poppy's kind of great point in question there, Kim Jong-un leaving the country, not something that happens very often. I think last time uh, he met with Putin was in 2019. Mm -hmm. um, him leaving, what does this say about him? Can you tell people kind of who he is, is known kind of as a hermit-like leader in a hermit-like kingdom to some degree? Well, it's, uh, North Korea is one of the most isolated countries in the world, and their leaders don't like to leave the country. Yes, he, and he, they don't like to fly. Often they take trains. Remember that Hanoi summit where Kim Jong-un rode 70 hours on a train to go and meet with President uh, Trump and come back. Um, I think it says that he's now feeling a little more relaxed, right? Uh, he was, during COVID years, North Korea was complete, you know, complete lockdown, and now he's actually going out, and now he wants to, you know, act like a normal leader of a normal country, which we know that he's not a normal leader of a normal country. We appreciate it, Sumi Terry. Thank you for all the analysis. Thank you for me on. Well, joining us now is the former European Affairs Director at the National Security Council, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. Uh, sir, thanks so much for your time. I, I want to start with there before we kind of dig in a little bit more on Ukraine and the idea of what we're seeing and what it means near term and longer term with this meeting between these two leaders. What's your sense of things? Uh, thanks for having me on. So I wouldn't overstate too much what this meeting means. Certainly, it means that uh, Putin is in a, a somewhat of a de desperate situation, uh, trying to acquire munitions that are severely depleted during this war effort. Uh, a lot of this would be uh, have been coordinated ahead of time. So he had some promises in that regard. Uh, it's not entirely clear what the the um, Koreans are getting in turn. Probably something in the form of advanced technologies. Probably something in the form of hard currency. What's striking to me is that uh, Putin didn't attend either the BRICS summit. Uh, the South uh, Africans uh, said that he, they couldn't guarantee the fact that they wouldn't take action against them. He didn't attend the G20, but he was, he's meeting, he's flying all the way from Moscow to Vladivostok to meet Kim Jong-un. 
uh, not a good turn of uh, events for um, somebody that positions himself as a, as a world leader. But I think the fact is that the Ukrainians are going to see some um, North Korean munitions start to arrive uh, on, in the war effort. I'd like your take on the language that was agreed on for the communique out of the G20, which was strikingly different when it comes to Russia's war in Ukraine than last year when there was an outright condemnation. There is not that. They were not, the United States and others supporting that were not able to get that out of the G20. Nikki Haley was very critical of that in her interview with Jake yesterday. She called it a win for Russia and China. Is she right? I think it's interesting. I, it's definitely not optimal with regards to Russia, Ukraine. It is the most critical geopolitical challenge the U.S. faces. But I think the fact is that the U.S. has global interests. Uh, it is looking long term to balance against China. And this was actually, in a lot of ways, a very successful G20, a lot of other business being handled. What they decided to do is not spoil long term objectives uh, with a communique that could have derailed. Um, you know, the rest of the, the bargains that was struck. So it is uh, somebody that watches Russia or Ukraine mm -hmm. war very closely. I would have uh, expected to see a much, much firmer position, stance. But in terms of substance, um, there was a lot that the president delivered. Mm -hmm. And frankly, um, the U.S. continues to provide support. The West continues to provide support. Uh, the language itself, you know, probably shouldn't have been the obstacle to the rest of the agenda. So it, it's worth it, net net, is what you're saying. What he got out of the trip is uh, worth it, even if you can't get yeah, these words. It's, I, I think it is a uh, probably an indication of the fact that the U.S. wasn't in as dominant a position mm -hmm. as it uh, may have been historically. Uh, some of the power has shifted to other members of the, of the G20. The U.S. is still the most important player uh, in that organization. Uh, so I would have liked to see a, a much stronger language. Uh, I think we probably could have gotten away with it, but um, it, it, I think we did okay. I think we did quite well on balance. The relationships, strengthened relationships with Vietnam, the um, kinds of bargains that were struck with the Indians, I think probably makes it, on balance, uh, makes it worth it. I was struck yesterday by uh, General Mark Milley, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, putting a timeline you almost forgot mm -hmm. in the middle of the counteroffensive in the middle of the summer that different weather, different uh, climate is coming soon in the war in Ukraine, saying about 30 to 45 days left before rainy weather pa patterns start to hamper the ongoing counteroffensive. What does that mean to you? You know, it's interesting that we tend to think about campaign uh, seasons, uh, this uh, somewhat bit, a bit of an antiquated notion about, you know, when it's effective to fight, when it's not effective to fight. I think a lot of our uh, leadership have experienced campaign seasons in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. There are winter lulls. I don't know if I would expect that much of a lull in the fighting between uh, Russia and Ukraine. I think in the northern and eastern parts around um, Kharkiv area, Luhansk, it, it does get, um, it's going to get probably a little bit more difficult to fight. I think in the south, that is an area that tends to be drier. We could very well see a fairly high level of fighting all the way through that season. So I wouldn't overstate the amount of time left. I think it's probably somewhere, I've been, I've been in this region. Uh, I think it's probably somewhere closer towards, you know, the very tail end of this year before really weather kind of seeps in and bogs down armored vehicles. But it's also not an armored vehicle fight. This is infantry, light infantry assaulting across fields. Uh, I think the fact is that there'll still be a high degree of fighting.